Ahoy there, jabronis. Welcome to Create and Destroy. I'm your host, Dan Donnarumma, and this is episode number 19. I'm super excited about today's guest, but before we get into that, here in Rochester, it is cold as shit right now. It snowed for probably close to 48 hours straight. We got close to two feet of snow. Right now, it's hovering around zero degrees Fahrenheit. It is cold as shit. I am so jealous of anyone that is from the West Coast or is somewhere where it's nice and warm because it is is miserable as fuck. Anyway, my guest for you today is Brian Manning. Brian is the lead singer for Bostonage. I was so freaking excited to sit down and speak with Brian. I am a big Bostonage fan. Their most recent release, Further Still, came out on September 14th by The Flenser, and I was anxiously awaiting this album to come out. And from the moment I I started listening to that release, I knew it was going to be one of my favorite releases for 2008. And in my last episode where I talked about my top 27 releases for 2018, Further Still was number three for me. And so Brian and I, we talked about that release. We talked about his vocals, his lyrics, which to me, his lyrics are absolutely fantastic. And that's one of the things that makes Bostonage so special to me is the lyrics and Brian's vocals. When I listen to Bostonage, I I can't help but feel like I'm listening to poetry, prose, set to black metal. It's fantastic. And that to me is what makes Bostonage's music so incredible to me and so special to me. So Brian and I talk about what goes into his writing, how he crafts the story, so to speak, for each song. And I feel very fortunate that I was able to have Brian come on to the show and do an interview with me. Bostonage is not a band that does interviews. As Brian mentions, this is only their second interview that they've done. So I feel super honored. I feel super excited that Brian was willing to to sit down with me and do an interview and, and let me ask him a bunch of questions. So let's get right into it. Here's my conversation with Brian Manning. Brian, how's it going, man? I am fine. How are you? I'm doing very well. Thanks so much. It is cold as shit in Rochester, New York, and I'm assuming that it's super nice in California right now. You assume correctly. So whenever I am preparing for interviews, I try my best to read up on as many interviews as I can beforehand. Sure. Unless I didn't go through enough Google search pages. I only came across one interview for the band, which is one that you did with Invisible Oranges from last August. Yeah, that should be, I think that's the only like full interview that I've ever done. Um, full length interview. Yeah, I have to assume that people reach out to the band, right, to do interviews? Uh, Not as much anymore. Do people just kind of know the deal at this point that you guys aren't that into doing interviews? Yeah, I guess so. So what has kept the band from doing interviews over the years? Uh, Initially, we just weren't interested in doing it. I mean, honestly, we never thought the band was going to, I guess, achieve the status we had. Not that we're like a huge band or anything, but we just had, it, it was just like a little band between friends and we were decided. So we thought we'd all played in bands before and didn't really uh, enjoy, you know, playing small shows where it's just five people or the other bands and their girlfriends kind of thing. I mean, I I know that's like a starting point for everyone, really. But uh, we just decided that we were going to do things on our own terms, I guess, only play shows that seemed special for one reason or another. And we also just decided that, you know, we weren't we we, we were actually going to do interviews. Uh, We were going to do we wanted to do something that we thought was pretty amusing where we'd have someone send us the questions and then we would answer them uh in writing but you know uh in our own strange ways you know such as like sending an image back that answers the question or something like that or you know something that we thought was amusing or whatever but then we decided that was probably would probably just come across as pretentious so we (laughs) decided not to do that in the end and just weren't super interested in doing interviews and figured we'd remain anonymous for a while once the band kind of got to the point where you know like we were like oh we actually have fans and you know i guess i i personally don't i think it's i find it weird to talk about myself a lot so i was never inclined to do interviews i'm kind of a generally reserved person 
just usually staying in my own head or whatever. But then, you know, we we reached a point where it was like, well, let's just change it up. Let's, you know, be a little more open about things, I guess, uh, if people are interested. So I've got to ask, what made you be down to speak with my Joker ass? Um, I guess probably the fact that you've done interviews with other Flenser artists. You know, like I listened to the one you did with Drowse and Tom from Planning for a Bur- for Planning for Burial and Dan from Have a Nice Life. You're I like I appreciate the fact that you have a standard for keeping things high quality, um, like keeping the audio high quality. A lot of times on podcasts, you know, you'll it'll be people over the phone and it just just sounds kind of wonky since it sounds lo-fi. Um, so yeah, I don't know. It sounded fun. Hell yeah, man. Well, I really appreciate it. You know, going back to that interview that you did with Invisible Oranges, there were several things that I found very interesting from from that interview, one of which was your comment uh, regarding the fact that self-doubt can be a challenge for you. And I, and that's definitely something that I struggle with with pretty much anything that I do hobbies-wise. But I thought that was very interesting because, you know, you, the band has released numerous albums at this point, and I find your music, music incredible. How do you mitigate that hurdle of of self doubt with your music and and the stuff that you're putting out? Uh, well, thank you for the compliments. Um, you know, uh, I don't know how to answer that question exactly. Um, it's self doubt is also present in everything I do, especially you know when you realize that people are actually going to listen to it, even if it's not like you know millions of people or whatever. You know, it's just you know a few thousand people. That's still it's hard. Um, usually when after we record something, uh, I'm really excited, and then by the time it's released, th- then the self doubt really sets in, and I by that time I've listened to it so many times that I'm just like. I just, I actually just, I can't listen to it anymore. I would just uh, have to step back for a while. Um, And like, and then when I go back and listen to it, it usually sounds fine, but sometimes I get really in my head about it. I'm just like, oh, this is, this is garbage. Like, I can't believe like anyone who says they like this, you know, has, is wrong or something. (laughs) I don't know. It's just something, a lot of the times I can just be like, well, I'm just, this is all just in my head and just try not to think about it and move on. But you know, it's always there. It's always hounding me so i i don't know if i've fully figured out how to deal with that yet or not um especially in like writing stuff um there'll be moments where i'm really excited about something but then when it gets to the point where it's gonna where i know that other people are gonna see it then then self-doubt really rears its head and you just kind of have to let it go and hope for the best hope people like it not dwell on it too much if they don't i guess or you know if you see a negative comment or something like that um try not to get too involved in that stuff but it's hard not to read reviews or read check twitter or whatever to see what people are saying um but yeah uh i'll definitely try to take a step back and you know move on to something else uh try to do better the next time keep that kind of attitude but yeah it's challenging yeah it's something that i definitely struggle with like my wife has to keep me in check and like rein me in sometimes but i i find it interesting that it's it's something that i've seen as a common theme or commonality in certain artists that i've interviewed or just reading interviews with other artists and it's something that i guess i feel like i still need to work on because i I feel very hesitant to share my poetry or my music with folks. And in that same interview that you had done with In- Invisible Oranges, you talked about listening to Midwife a bunch. And I, uh, dude, I freaking love Midwife. Her music is so goddamn awesome. I wound up hearing like author, like daughter sometime around Christmas last year. And then I listened to it t- almost into the summer. And I wound up saying in my most recent interview or uh, episode that I felt like she would be a perfect Flenser band. So I'm just throwing that out. Out there just saying <laughs> but how freaking incredible is is madeline johnson and and her music yeah it's great uh i love it i've listened to that album at least 20 to 30 times at this point it's great i agree with you i don't know if i have much more to add to it really but yeah i love it i love that album have you listened to the ep that she put out over the summer prayer Hands? yeah i did i've listened to that a few times as well it's really it's also very good yeah yeah she's freaking she's incredible yeah I agree. I I didn't realize that you work for the Flenser until you and I started talking and started to get this scheduled. And so I wanted to talk about your role there and and working with the the label. So what is it that you do for the the Flenser? Sure. Um, I've worked there for a few years now. I do. I mean, there's just two of us. So I kind of both share a lot of the work. Jonathan is the guy who started the label. Uh, He's kind of the, the label visionary. And I 
tend to do more detail oriented things. Like I do the accounting, I do some of the, you know, the write-ups and stuff like that, the press copy. Um, we kind of both do that. I do a lot of the mail order. So a lot of times when people order stuff from us, I'm the one that packed it. Not always, but you know, it kind of just depends on what's going on at the time. We'll switch off roles. I think both of our, our styles kind of complement each other. Jonathan's more of the visionary. He knows what he wants to do, where he wants to take the label. And I'm, I'm more of a background kind of guy. So I, I don't mind just, you know, doing some of the grunt work that's required, you know, the day-to-day stuff that's just required to get, keep things moving. I'm totally content doing that kind of stuff. Um, and I'm generally pretty organized person. Uh, so yeah, organized and detail oriented. So I don't have a problem, you know, keeping track of all the, the financial stuff, uh, or, you know, just doing mail order or whatever. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of like, there's a lot that goes into running a label, uh, more than probably most people who haven't done it before would ever expect uh so yeah there's just like every every day is kind of something different but yeah it's it's definitely the most fulfilling job i've ever had in my life i actually feel like i'm you know accomplishing something putting something out into the world i I don't feel as self-conscious about that i don't have much self-doubt about it because probably because it's not my own art and for the most part uh, we did do the flenser did do uh the most recent bdn album but yeah it's it's great it's fun it's work when you were younger, did you ever think that you would be working for a record label and in a metal band? Um, not really. Maybe in a metal band. I've known the guitar player from BDN. We've been I've known him since like fourth grade or something like that. We've gone to school together since you know we were like ten. Um, and when we were teenagers, was when he started to learn how to play guitar. And he would, uh, you know, we he would we always hang out. We'd always listen to music together and stuff. Him and you know a few of other friends who got into metal when we were pretty young and yeah so we we started writing music together quite a long time ago um we had a, a band together long before bdn that was like i don't know we, we put out like a little demo tape of like black metal stuff where i was playing drums and doing the vocals and i can't play drums at all so it sounds really embarrassing but yeah we did that and then we that's how we met our Harry, our current drummer, was like, there used to be this website called powerslave.com back in the day. It was like a Bay Area metal site where it was kind of like a forum, but also like a directory of local bands. So people would use the forums. There weren't very many people that listened to death metal or black metal. So there was just, you know, maybe a dozen dozen plus people that were like that. So the people that did like that tended to get in touch with each other. And I posted, hey, anyone want a copy of this black metal demo that I just made? Two people responded um, and Harry was one of them. And he listened to it and he's like, yeah, the guitars and the vocals are pretty good. I could play drums for this. And then I happened to hook up with another friend of mine from high school who played bass and he I gave him the demo and he pretty much said the same thing. <laughs> the, the vocals and the, the guitars are good. Uh, I could play bass. And then so we formed a different band back then. Uh, we ended up calling ourselves Kale, like K-A-I-L, which is kind of before the vegetable was really uh, well known. Bit of an unfortunate name at this point. But we recorded a couple albums and they started to get more like avant-garde and strange as we wrote them and they're not really available online or anywhere uh and they're kind of i find them kind of embarrassing at this point too but it was fun at the time obviously established relationship with our drummer at that point um who i've been friends with since you know like for like 15 years now or longer and then our current bass player we met also sometime back around that time he worked with harry at a bookstore um and he also listened to metal so at some point well the bdn started with just the three of us guitars drums and me and we recorded our demo with just three people and then you know, our other friend was like, Hey, I want to play bass. So we, that's when we recorded our first album, but that doesn't quite answer your question about, uh, if I ever thought I would be in a metal band, I guess, but I I mean to say that I've, you know, kind of always wanted to play music and I've always been really interested in music. And I, I definitely never expected to work in the music industry or anything, but I can't say that I'm unhappy about the way things ended up. I'm, you know, like it's pretty, pretty great to have a band that got attention, feel pretty fortunate about that. And, you know, seeing the kind of inner workings workings of the music industry, it's, you see how difficult it is for people to take interest in bands, especially now when there's just such a proliferation of, of music. There's just so much available that it's kind of impossible to keep track of everything that's going on. So just, I guess we kind of came out 
before that got super bad. But yeah, I, I mean, definitely feel fortunate that people are interested in the music we're making. And it's pretty thrilling to work for a record label that people are in- interested in and care about. Yeah, that part of my life is is great. That's awesome. And so Bostonage, well, first let me ask, that's how you pronounce the band name, right? It's Bostonage? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or close enough okay. anyway. I, I, I studied French a long time ago, but it's been probably about 10 years. Uh, so I probably also pronounce it a bit incorrectly. It's, that's another thing that's kind of funny is it's kind of a tradition for black metal bands to choose like a really obscure name really uh there's a lot of bands that have names that are really you know you look at them and you you just want to laugh because it's just like it's absurd uh to want to say it out loud or whatever and i think we we kind of chose that name thinking along those same lines the guys were just like why don't you just you know pick something from one of the from one of your books or whatever find find some band name and i made a list and that was one of them and everyone's like yeah let's go with that with uh bostonage and i hear a lot of people say like bossy Nagy or something like that uh, because it's i think in english you are inclined to pronounce the e's at the end of words but it's a, a french word so you generally don't so i've got to be honest i would forever i was pronouncing it boston nog mm-hmm. until i googled how to pronounce this and then it was just like a random video of how to pronounce the band name i don't know if someone made made it specifically because of that or if it's for something else, but that's how I, I learned how to pronounce it. Yeah, that's really funny. I actually found a video on YouTube. I think I just like Google searched our name once and there was this video on YouTube is like how to pronounce Bostonage. And I I was like, oh, I should just like post this on Facebook or whatever. And then when I went back to find it to do that, it was gone. <laughs> So I don't know what happened to it. <laughs> yeah, that that's how I learned how to pronounce it. So yeah, so to go back to what you were talking about, so you guys have known each other for a very long time. The band started, right, sometime around like 2005, 2006 or so? Yeah, around then, yeah. Uh, we'd, um, like I said, we were in another band earlier and that kind of just like, like our bass player moved away. The, it was the other bass player. Um, he moved away and I don't know, it kind of felt like it ran its course at that point. It didn't feel like it was going anywhere. That was, that was a band where we'd play, you know, we'd go play a, whatever show we could get and it would just be in some bar where no one cared or whatever. And then, so we kind of just didn't do anything together for a while. And then Harry and Mike, the guitar player, went off and, you know, played in some other bands together. And then Harry was in, oh yeah, they, they played in a couple bands together. And then at some point, I don't even remember who it was at this point anymore, but someone was like, let's just like get back together and play, you know, some like old, old school black metal. And we were like, yeah, that sounds great. So we, we, you know, borrowed a rehearsal space and just wrote some songs uh, that became the songs on our demo. Um, I don't know how, how like exactly traditionally black metal those are at this point, but definitely more so than our, our more recent work. But yeah, we were just we were content to just you know play some songs that we we liked, and then uh, then our bass player joined, and that's kind of like when we you know invented our ethos about not doing interviews and stuff. I mean, originally also part of the band was uh, like all the all the lyrics on the first album and the demo are two demos. They're all just like me reading passages from books. I'd never intended to. We never intended to write lyrics for it necessarily. I did a couple of the songs in the first album. I have some pretty primitive attempts at writing lyrics. But the idea was just, you know, if we ever played live, I would just like be reading from books the entire time while doing vocals. And that never really happened, but uh, that was the idea. So we kind of, you know, made up our own, had our own, like what we, we, we found them amusing. It wasn't really anything serious or anything like that. After we recorded our first album, it was kind of like a really, we did it all ourselves with like, we had some help from someone uh, that, who we shared a practice space with who happened to he who's a recording engineer and he helped us a little bit but it was mostly just us and then afterwards we kind of like didn't really do anything with it and we're like i guess it kind of ran its course or whatever and then a few years later jonathan from the flenser contacted us and it was kind of when he was just about to start the label up and he was like hey i'm you know i want to i'm about to start a record label and i want to release your album and we were just like yeah sure go for it and that kind of revitalized our interest in making music again and then we got back together and wrote our second album after that so i i find what you're you were saying about the lyrics so interesting because one of the things that has always drawn me to the band with the two things specifically the lyrics and the vocals are are tremendous and i love the fact that yes you guys are a metal band but i love that like a lot of the flenser bands there's a pulling from different genres and it's not just strictly this is a metal band at least that's that's how i feel but specifically with the lyrics and the vocals i 
I love the lyrics because I feel like your lyrics toe the line between poetry and prose so well. And I feel like it's such a symbiotic marriage between the the instrumentation, your vocals and your lyrics. So when you eventually started to write your your own lyrics and not just read them from a book how i guess how important was it for you to have lyrics that just like they're written now they they do toe the line between poetry and prose um well thank you i really appreciate that um well like like i said in the last question um i had written a couple sets of lyrics for the first album some of the songs were also songs from our demo that we we recorded or whatever so they just had like the book lyrics but i you know took a stab at it i mean i've always been really into literature um and books and writing but that self-doubt was always there i never liked anything that i wrote it always just you know it never seemed like i was doing anything original or whatever and i always had this idea i think a lot of people have this idea where you're you feel like you have to do something totally original or not at all Right. And that's not really how it works. Most people, you know, start out kind of aping their idols and even continue doing that really through their entire careers. But I guess I when I wrote the the two sets of lyrics for the first album, which I don't even I don't even have them anymore. But the other guys were like, Oh yeah, these are these are pretty good. So that kind of encouraged me to write more for the second album. And then p- other people said they were pretty good. Um so I I don't know, I kind of like encouraged me to keep trying and i do feel like i was kind of aping you know people like baudelaire or something like bataille on my early lyrics i mean that's the stuff i was reading heavily around that time um that just kind of naturally have evolved i feel like i've landed more on my own voice at this point i also feel like i've gone completely off track of this question um <laughs> <laughs> did, I, did i answer the question i don't even remember exactly yeah this. yeah I, th- I i think you did you know i i it still is such a surprise for me to hear you say that there were definitely moments where you doubted your your lyrics i think your lyrics are are fantastic can you walk me through like what that looks like when you're sitting down to write lyrics how long does that take how do you arrive at like the story so to speak of the lyrics um how often are you rewriting them things along those lines sure um it kind of depends from song to song some of them will have have some inspiration from you know events in my life or sometimes i'll just be in like a spell of depression or something like that and then something will you know kind of click like for example on the new album the song my shroud i was just like in a total funk for a week or two and then all of a sudden this concept occurred to me and i wrote it really quickly that's probably the quickest i've ever written a song like how quick are we talking like actually okay it's not the quickest i've ever written a song but it was very quick like i wrote it within you know 20 minutes it was just like it came it came out i didn't I, i only needed to adjust a few words after afterwards and you know even going back later on i was like okay yeah this is this is it but the quickest song i ever wrote was actually um the marie in a cage song from our second album that i wrote in about five minutes and it was because i was just like could not think of anything to write i just was really frustrated had writer's block and i just wrote it as a joke kind of and then i brought it to practice and i was like hey you guys here to check out these lyrics and everyone's like oh these are great and i was like oh okay <laughs> I guess we'll use them. And then, you know, generally it really depends from song to song. Some of them I'll just like agonize over for months, tweaking words here and there. Uh, sometimes they'll come out pretty quickly and only need like minor adjustments later on. But I'm, I'm generally adjusting stuff in them all the way up until we record. And then I'm just like, I, I got to settle on this. I usually have, you know, a couple other people read them, make sure like I, I didn't make any huge grammatical blunders or anything like that or, uh, you know, mess up the tense or anything. Yeah, generally by the time we're getting near the end of the album, they're all pretty finalized, but I have definitely tweaked words here and there all the way up until we recorded them. And then at that point, I'm just like, okay, I got to step back. These are done now. But yeah, it really depends. Like sometimes I'll just have uh, like a phrase that occurs to me or I'll ha- I'll think of some idea and I'm like, I want to write something that's representative of this idea, but you know, maybe not directly or not in an obvious way or whatever. But some songs will start, yeah, just with a phrase uh, that I think of. And then the concept kind of forms around that, or some will start with the concept and then I'll go through different iterations of the story until uh, I feel like I landed on like what expresses it best. But yeah, some songs, yeah, they'll come out pretty quickly in a day or two. Some songs, 
I'll spend months tweaking or, you know, entirely scrapping. Like, for instance, the song on the, on the new album, The Trench, uh, was originally uh, pretty different. And then I wrote, I started writing it out and then it became almost like a short story, like a pretty long one. And then I was like, okay, I have this short story. This is way too long to use as lyrics. So I kind of switch it up in such a way that I, I'm still actually like decided to go back and like finish writing it as a short story, but I haven't finished it yet. But essentially the la- the paragraph that is the trench is like the end of the story. And then the rest of it's all the stuff that was just too long to fit into that. Like they couldn't really uh, tweak it in such a way that uh, it made sense to use as lyrics but yeah they're all they're all different they all have their own stories i mean the older ones i don't remember as well except for you know like marina cage is obvious because it was such a funny origination yeah like, the god on we was actually a phrase from a book that i was reading at the time that the the lyrics themselves don't really have anything to do with it but there was this book i was reading that's about like uh there's this old story called the wandering jew it's about this a guy who I guess, kind of cursed Jesus when he was on the cross and then was in turn cursed to walk the earth uh, forever. And he wanders the earth for the 2000 years since the crucifixion. And I don't know, I've always found that story really fascinating. And it's appeared in several different books that I've, I've read, like as a kind of incidental character that that isn't necessarily central to the story or whatever. But then I found this book that had, that was like all about that. And I was like, oh, I got to read this book. And there was this recurring theme, the God on me. And I really liked that phrase. And I kind of just wrote my own story around it. But yeah, each one, each one's a little different. It's probably like the most insight I've ever or most revealing the stuff I've ever like told about these the lyrics. Yeah, some of them are like really personal, but they're so abstract that no one would ever know what I'm talking about. Like I can't even think of the name of the song anymore. The second song on all fours, industry of, industry of distance. I wrote that after a friend committed suicide. Um, so a lot of the themes in there are really personally tied to that. Though I don't think it's necessarily all that obvious to anyone re- else reading the lyrics. And that's what I do find about your lyrics to be so amazing is that there is that abstract, you know, you had mentioned before, kind of like avant-garde quality to them. And I, I feel like they just work so so perfectly with the music. And, I, you know, for me, one of the things that I'm I'm very, very impressed by, I talked about this in a recent episode um, that I did where I was t- talking about further still that I, I write music and I try to write vocal patterns and it is really tough for me. I wind up writing vocal patterns that follow the melody more often than not of the guitar. And I hate that I do that. And so when I listen to Boston Age, I'm always super impressed by the fact that you write these like short stories basically and then you are screaming viciously to this music and it it sounds so so great how did you how did you develop that how do you how do you work out developing vocal patterns for songs um that's i you know honestly they just kind of like naturally come about um it definitely takes usually the vocals are the last thing that we add to the songs like we'll we generally write songs together, so we'll, we'll all sit around in our, our rehearsal space and, you know, suss out a song over a few weeks. Yeah, usually, uh, like, on with, with Further Still and All Fours as well, we had, don't necessarily even add the the vocals to them right when we finish them. Sometimes it's a little later. It kind of depends on, like, uh, on how long it's taken me to write the lyrics. Like some some songs are more last minute than others. But generally I'll try to like even ha- I'll have like a rough draft that I'll bring. And I don't know, I just, we record every rehearsal we have. So I'll uh, record myself doing, you know, whatever, just doing whatever vocals occur at the time. Um, and then slowly over time, listening to the things, I'll pick out like patterns that I like and make, like, okay, I got to remember that for next time. And then it kind of becomes muscle memory. You know, they change a little bit all the way up pretty much until we record them. And then after that, when we're rehearsing them to play live, I'm sure they still change a little bit. But yeah, it's just kind of, for me, it's natural. It's always, I mean, we've been same guys playing this music together for so long. So we kind of all know how we work and stuff. I'll hear, hear the songs as we're forming them. And I'll try to think of, you know, this part should not not have vocals or whatever but in the end it just comes down to me doing them and kind of just fine-tuning them over over a few weeks or a month or whatever until i get the patterns that i that i like down yeah i don't know i mean i appreciate that that you enjoy them but i don't i don't know if i can add any give you any tips really uh, i can it just feels so natural to me to just do it and i think the the length of the lyrics often dictate how the go in the songs like on further still a lot of pretty much all the lyrics are pretty long they're all like you know a paragraph of text and a lot of lyrics song lyrics 
generally tend to be much more sparse than that. So I think that uh, having these long texts sort of dictates how I have to do them. And I feel like my vocals change a bit over every re- every recording and it's not even intentional. It's just like something that happens. Um, and I think it's interesting because I, it's not like any kind of conscious decision to uh, like, I'll change my vocals so they sound a little bit more this way, a little more screechy or, you know, whatever it is. Um, it just kind of naturally comes out that way and naturally changes over time evolves uh, with the songs. I find that so interesting because for me, for it winds up being easier for me to write vocal patterns with with less lyrics or sparser lyrics as you'd mentioned um so for me when i see when i listen to the songs and i'm and i'm going through the lyrics to me it's almost like holy shit how is how is he singing like this with all these freaking lyrics and i also find it interesting that you're you're so and I guess it's not unsurprising that the rehearsals and the creations of the songs wind up becoming like these living creations where they're they're changing over time. Is that what you see has been the process for you guys over the years? That that's how you guys work. You start on something and it just kind of builds and winds up becoming its own thing over time. Yeah, pretty much. Um, we we have a very dem- democratic writing process. Um, generally, our guitar player will come with a few riffs uh, and then we'll record them. But like right, pretty much at this point, right when we're recording them, you know, it's like almost like a jam or whatever, you know, they'll, they'll play guitar, bass and drums over them and just record like a piece essentially. And then the next practice, we add a little bit more to it and the next one and a little bit more until we pretty much have a song. And then from there, we'll, you know, we'll listen to the recordings we do and fine tune it like, oh, this part seems like it's going a little too long or this part seems like it needs something else. Um, and then, you know, little details get, shifted uh people some of the some interesting things happen when people make mistakes like sometimes i'll just be in a recording someone will play something wrong and then we'll come back to max and be like i actually like that that was played wrong like let's keep doing it that way so the song will change that way or you know there'll be like different bass flourishes added you know kind of last minute or whatever as just just as you play them they kind of you kind of get a sense that this part needs something else or it would be interesting to add you know a different uh, melody here or or whatever um so yeah they they definitely kind of change over time some probably some more than others uh i'd say that they none of them feel you know totally finalized until we record them in the studio that's very interesting and i'm thinking as you're talking about this shit man how much like you guys must have hours and hours and hours and hours of your practices recorded, right? You must have like external hard drives of, of that stuff. You know? <laughs> uh, I definitely have a lot of them. Um, they're all like unlabeled and sitting in a folder on my desktop. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of them. Uh, <laughs> With further still, how long did you guys work on the songs that would wind up on the album? Quite a long time, actually. It's probably the most time we spent on an album, um, but not necessarily because we felt like, oh, we have to take extra time to work on this album. It's more because we had life just got in the way. Um, We all have jobs and other hobbies and stuff. So it was just like there'd be periods where we couldn't no one could we couldn't make our schedules line up to rehearse or whatever. So the songs, the songwriting was a lot slower. I don't know if that was a good thing or not. Uh, It just is what it is. Uh, Like vestiges, we wrote pretty much uh, right immediately after we finished all fours. Um, We'd even played it live a few times like years ago but most of the other songs yeah they'd just be written over yeah over about like three years two years something like that gotcha yeah and i and you know i remember when the album when the flenzer had you know put out the release the press release for the album talking about the songs i I stole this when I did my uh, my recent episode being airtight and propulsive. And I think that is such a perfect description of those songs. You know, for when you guys were writing these songs and working on them, why did you why did the band want to challenge yourselves with creating songs that would wind up being I don't know if shorter is a be- is the best way to say them, but you know, just more kind of a punch in the mouth so to speak than than songs in some of the previous releases. You know, it just it just sounded like something interesting to try. Um, there's no, nothing really deeper than that. We wrote, like I said, we wrote Vestiges first, and that ended up being short, pretty concise. And that wasn't really the impetus to keep writing short songs or anything. It was At some point, we were just like, you know, it would be interesting to try writing just really brief songs um, just to see how, how it turned out. We, we also had the caveat that we would we would write a longer song if it felt like the song needed it. 
and I, I would say that uh, a far away place is an example of that. It's like the longest song on the album. Uh, oh, that song's it, so good, dude. Yeah, that's my favorite song from the album. Personally. Oh, it's so awesome. The end is so goddamn good. Man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When when uh, we wrote that riff, or when our guitar player wrote that riff, it was just like, oh, we got to save that for. We got to figure out something special for that. Uh, <laughs> And then it became what it is in that song, and yeah, we all, we all really love it. I mean, everyone kind of has their own favorite songs of on each album or whatever. But that one's mine, my favorite song on that album. Yeah, I, first off, I love that song. And secondly, I think that is, I'm such a big fan. I feel like more often than not, the albums that wind up being some of my favorite albums, the first song is like a punch in the face. This, the last song is like a punch in the face. And I feel like, you know, that's definitely how I feel with, with Further Still. And I think Far Away Places is such a freaking perfect song to to cap off the album with. Yeah, I, yeah. Um, originally it was conceived, we, we were thinking about putting it at the beginning of the album because it's also, like you said, it's like a big punch in the face when that thing starts starts really abruptly and just really in your face. Uh, but then at some point that changed. I don't, even, I don't even remember how the suggestion came about. But yeah, then it seemed like, well, we kind of knew, I guess, that it either had to be the first song or the last song on the album pretty much right off the bat. But yeah, uh, it's a weird, interesting song in my opinion. When you dwell upon Further Still, what thoughts come to mind for you? Um, it's still a little close to the album's release. I haven't listened to it in a while. Yeah, I I find it hard to listen to stuff that we've done. Um, we all, The way it usually goes for me is I'll be really excited while we're writing it really excited when we're getting ready to record it and everything's done and like really you know just excited to get it down on tape and get it out into the world i think everyone feels this way when they finish recording um and i think most bands on labels can identify with this that you finish recording and you're just like okay it's done i want it out right now and it's just not the way things work there's always you know a few months at least before an album is released and during that time when it's recorded we were you know, I, I was, I can't speak for the other guys, but uh, I was, you know, so really excited about it and listening to it a lot. And then basically around the time when we got like the test pressings, I was kind of over it, ready to work on new stuff. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, then it came out. And I mean, by that time I was just like, okay, I can't, I can't even handle this anymore. I can't listen to it. I think I listened to it one time after it came out, but I haven't since then. I, I have to go back and we're, we're starting to rehearse again and I, I was like, I have to go back and listen to some of these songs again to hear how they were recorded because like, there's like certain parts where I know I'm not getting the vocals quite right how they were on the recording. I just like forgot what the time they're supposed to start is or whatever. So I have to, I'm going to have to go back and listen to it soon. And same with, you know, all fours. We're gearing up to play some live dates in a couple months. Hell yeah, man. Any, any East Coast dates by any chance? Uh, nothing planned currently. Uh, we definitely want to go to the East Coast. We've never, I mean, we don't play live very often. It's, uh, we do want to go there and I think we will at some point do a, a small tour over there. We're never, I don't think we're ever going to be like a major touring band. It's just not really, I think we're a little too old at this point. It's always like, I mean, we've done a couple of like very small tours. One that was like, it could barely be classified as a tour that we did in Europe, but it was like, you know, four or five dates. But then we did like a small West Coast tour and just doing that was like, oh man, it was brutal after, <laughs> but we did like 10 or 11 days with no breaks. And like my voice was just shot by the end and everyone was tired and we're all, we're all in like our thirties. So it's just like, oh, uh, I wish we did this when we were younger, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that that's something that I've thought about when listening to the band before is when you like I think about shit, if I had to sing these songs and for a live set, I would want to pass the fuck out right after playing. So, like, let's just say if you do one a weekend show or like maybe a few shows over a, a span of a couple months or whatever, how do you usually feel after you you perform? Um, generally, when we're rehearsing every week once or twice a week, uh, my voice holds up pretty well. I tend to like go really all out when we're playing live. Um, I think just like being in front of people on a stage, I kind of, I don't know, feel obligated to, or I just, just being in that environment puts me in like a certain headspace where I, you know, really just like put my all into it. And so usually after a show, I'll, you know, I'll talk to people and people will come up and, you know, 
thank us or whatever. Um, and I'll end up having, I'll end up like working in the merch booth or something like that too. So I'll talk a lot after that. And then, then the next day my voice will be pretty scratchy, but, um, when we're rehearsing every week, it's generally not too bad. Um, holds up pretty well, surprisingly. That's awesome. Yeah. I, you know, for me, when I, when I sing, if I push my voice a little bit too much, I definitely notice that my voice starts to get scratchy and I'm not even playing just for me. So I, I give you some credit when you, when you think about Bosch Denage, everything that you guys have put out there for others, what comes to mind when you think about the band? How do you feel about what you guys have done up to this point? Um, I'd like to think that we've released interesting music. Um, it's interesting to us. Obviously, we started out as more like a straight black metal band, and over time, uh, that's shifted quite a lot. Um, and I've always been kind of interested in the fringe acts in black metal like the bands that you know experiment with other genres or you know weird instruments and things like that i mean i like the straightforward stuff too but there was this really weird time in like the late 90s the early 2000s where bands were just doing like really weird stuff and it was always i always was interested in checking that stuff out and i think just being a fan of music in general not just metal i've always appreciated you know genre crossovers or like certain elements from one genre being added to another to in a complimentary way uh you know it doesn't always work but a lot of when it does work it's really interesting and i like to think that we've done stuff like that and yeah i mean i'm i definitely feel you know proud of the work that we've done and what we've achieved um even though you know it's like not like anything major i don't i don't have any weird like inflated sense that we're some massive band or anything like that but you know just having fans in general having some fans is like it's really humbling and it's just it's it's humbling and it's, it's, it's kind of strange range i guess like to think that other people care about what you do and yeah i mean it's there's you gotta that juggles around with self-doubt but uh it's the fact that you know i'm doing like a podcast or whatever it, it, there's an indication that you know people are interested in what we're doing and that's that's something to be proud of i think um and at the end of the day i definitely feel that and appreciate it and i love music so i definitely intend to keep making music in some way or another you know probably for the rest of my life um so it's it's great to, that other people are interested in checking it out hell yeah man I, I agree with you one of the things that i love about bostonage pretty much most of the the artists that the flenser put out as i mentioned earlier is that there is drawing from other genres of music to create something that i think is really unique. And I think Boston Aj does that very, very well. When you guys are working on your your songs and in your albums, how much of a conscious effort is there to create something that you feel is unique? Or is it just kind of we're making music that we like and if it's unique, cool. If it's just something that we like and maybe it's similar to other shit that's already been put out, so be it. Uh it's it's more of the latter, I would say. It just it kind of just it comes naturally, I guess. Just we all listen to different music, uh different types of music, metal and beyond. I mean like I love metal and I always will. I've listened to it since I was a teenager and I will always in some way love metal, but like it definitely, you know, it gets old. There's a lot of stagnation in the genre uh, but there's also a lot of experimentation and uh, you know new stuff that's being done so I don't want to say like you know metals such a stagnant thing because it's not really uh, but there is a lot of a lot there is a, an aspect of it where you know where people you know want it to be a certain thing or whatever and that it can't really deviate from that and that's fine for them uh, that's not really what I'm interested in I guess at least in terms of making music it's kind of funny too like we get kind of lumped into genres of stuff that I aren't really i'm not really very knowledgeable about like a lot of people hear you know screamo in our sound or scrams and that's like not really anything i don't i'm totally fine with that uh but i it's not really stuff i ever listened to so it's really interesting to me people will be like oh you guys sound have you ever heard this band you sound you know very similar and i was like i've never heard of this band before <laughs> i'm very surprised by that i don't i don't get screamo from from boston at all like for me black metal definitely especially in some of the older stuff like i sometimes feel like like there's uh, like post rock elements in the songs. I do not get screamo at all. Yeah, I mean, I see people say it quite often actually. But I mean, I, I like I said, I don't, I don't have anything against screamo or anything about. It. I don't really, I just don't really listen to it. Or it wasn't, you know, it wasn't in my wheelhouse when I was was younger when I was listening to aggressive music exclusively or anything like that. But yeah, I mean, I've always just been interested. I think for me, what it is is there are exceptions, but I generally 
tend to like music with uh, like dark themes. I've always been kind of like obsessed with death, I guess, or found it interesting, you know, and just like mortality in general. So I tend tended to always like music that had some either like some aggressive aspect or, you know, appealed to feelings of melancholy or depression or whatever. Like that's the music that I've always identified with. So there's a lot of that kind of stuff in metal. And uh, I guess I discovered, you know, other genres of stuff also had equally dark themes that were, you know, like similarly addressed, but in a different style of music. And I've always just been attracted to that kind of stuff, whether it's, you know, electronic music or drone or, you know, all kinds of stuff, really. I mean, there's just like regular rock music that's that fits that bill as well. Pretty much every genre, uh, really. So I've always just kind of, kind of like sought out that kind of stuff and over the years have learned you know, of all kinds of music because of that beyond metal. But yeah, I mean, just as musicians, it just naturally kind of happens. The songs just kind of come out the way they do without any real like conscious decision to write in a certain style or anything like that. I think just like the variety of music that we listen to um, that influences us kind of leads it to naturally come out the way it does without a specific preconceived idea of what it should be beforehand nice and uh not to go back to to that interview that you did back in august but i i did read that you're you've been working on a book which i think is awesome is it poetry is it prose that you're that you're you've been writing uh yeah it's it's prose um i've been writing a novel i've actually i haven't worked on it in a couple of months i've been writing working on a couple of short stories which i'm almost done with i want to try to finish those up and maybe release like a chat book or something like that. But I definitely get caught up on being a perfectionist and just getting, uh, I haven't, I feel like I haven't fully figured out my writing voice yet. Like I'm still, I may, maybe no one ever really finds or feels like they found their voice completely, but I definitely feel like I haven't, uh, and I'm, I'm working towards it and like kind of figuring out how, how to do it really. I mean, I've always been interested in writing and, and books and literature, like I said earlier, but I haven't, it's, it's another thing to do it yourself, I guess. I think that applies to music as well. Like you can, it's pretty easy to appreciate someone else's work, but then when you, when you're trying to do it yourself, you're like, am I, am I, am I sure I'm coming at this story from like the right perspective or, you know, like, is this, is this happening correctly? Directly. Like, I don't know. It's just, it's just a lot to figure out. I think uh, I, I need to, I, I just haven't quite figured it out yet. Um, and I'm working on it. And I know I like released an excerpt from a book a while ago on Noisy for when we did all fours, they put it like a little excerpt of the book. I was working on it then too. And people were like, oh, when is this going to be done? And I was like, oh man, this was like, so in the beginnings of this book, <laughs> the, there's it's not going to be done for a while yet. I don't know. It's not even going to be like a super long book. And I have it all figured out. I just haven't figured out the actual words, like the actual writing of it, uh, I guess. But I, I mean, I feel very driven to, to finish it. So I think it will happen. I feel like it's something I have to do. So at some point I will finish it, but I don't think anyone should hold their breath. <laughs> Wait, waiting for it. It's going to be a little while. <laughs> Dude, I I really hope that you do, especially like a chat book. I think that'd be awesome as hell. So yeah. I am all for it. I think you should totally do it. I definitely really want to finish these little stories that I'm working on. One of them is like I said earlier, I was working on a short story of the trench. One of them is that, and another one is just like a completely different thing that also incidentally started out as like an idea for lyrics. They kind of spiraled out of control. I had this idea, and it couldn't. Every time I tried to figure it out for. For lyrics, I couldn't keep it concise enough that it would work. So I just decided that it needed to be a short story. And now it's kind of like keeps expanding a little bit. I mean, it's still going to be a short story, but it's like way longer than I ever anticipated that this little idea that I had would be. But yeah, I'm, ge- I'm getting there on it. Uh, it's, it's just... It's hard to stay, um, stay to do that stuff. Like I wake up really early every day, not really early, but pretty early every day. And I work, I try to work on writing every morning for at least an hour. Wow. But, um, that's impressive, man. Cause I, I typically don't do that. Like I go, I, if, if something comes into my head, I'll go and write, write. Um, 
it's usually like emotion based my writing so I don't set specific times which like right now I haven't written anything in like two three weeks which kind of sucks but then I'll go through spurts where I'll write something every day for weeks on end yeah I definitely have a similar thing too like I'll sometimes a phrase will just occur to me and I'm like I have to write this down yeah sometimes it'll be like when I'm falling asleep or you know when I'm just driving in the car or something like that and I'll just like I'll if I'm driving the car I'll just have to try to like memorize it until I can hit a stoplight or something like that and jot it down real quick yeah I mean I try to do that too when ideas occur to me some that definitely had lyrics start out just from some phrase that I thought of while I was doing some other activity but yeah I try to especially with the short stories if, if I can't think of anything new to write or you know if the book as well like I'll just like go back over and like fine-tune stuff or something at least like I, I try to I mean I have like a ton of words written I just like it's just not there yet but yeah I, it's I feel like from you know different interviews and things that I've read with about, about writers and stuff a lot of people seem to think that persistence is the most important thing uh really just putting in the time and just continuing taking taking long breaks and stuff just really like breaks up the rhythm and like you'll just get there eventually like if the most important trait really is just that you persist so i've been trying to take that to heart and just like keep at it and it's hard to time for i would love to dedicate more time to writing but there's just so many things to do i mean i love movies and i love reading i try to read i've been trying to read at least two books a month but like when you balance you know having the band which band honestly doesn't take up a huge amount of time of my life um generally it depends on what we're doing but there's that i mean there's there's the working at the flenser you know just everything i mean i have a girlfriend uh we've been together for a really long time like nine years uh, so it's like i'm spending tons of time with her i have two dogs uh there's just like so much to do it's hard to get home at the end of the day after working and commuting and just be like okay now i'm gonna sit down and write yeah oh god i totally (laughs) understand yeah what have you been listening to lately um, I've been in kind of like a, a music funk the last couple of weeks, actually. I, this happens sometimes where I'm just like, nothing sounds all that appealing to me to want to listen to. So when that happens, I kind of tend to just listen to, you know, like old standbys uh, or, you know, ambient music or something. I obviously I listen to, you know, everything the Flenser is going to release. So I'll definitely get to hear, you know, demos and stuff and or like test pressings of things. Like by the time an album is, comes out and everyone's first hearing it, I've heard it like 30 30 times or something like that usually when everyone else is starting to get excited i'm like okay i'm done with this i guess that's it's kind of the same phenomena as like as uh bdn stuff it's just like all right now everyone else can get excited and i'll just move on to something else yeah i I really like the new current 93 album from this year listening to that quite a bit recently i've never listened to them before what do they sound like they have a massive discography that uh is pretty experimental um it's the band is, is driven by one guy um, who's been there from the beginning, um, and he kind of is just the vocalist. And the quality of each album really just depends on who he's collaborating with. He's really a visionary artist. Uh, he's amazing, writes amazing lyrics. It's been a longtime favorite of mine. But starting in like the 2000s, at some point, I kind of lost a bit of interest in the in Current 93 because the people, I guess, just the people he was collaborating with didn't weren't as interesting to me. Um, but this album's kind of a return to form in a lot of ways. Ways. I, I I kind of felt like even his lyrics on those previous albums was kind of to kind of taking a dip in quality, it kind of almost sounded like self parody at times. Um, and I feel like it really came back together on this new album. It's called "The Light Is Leaving Us All." It's really good. Nice. Is that like one that you would recommend I start with? Um, sure. I mean, it's not their best album, um, but I think you can get an idea of like their it kind of does uh, fit in with like their best stuff. I think like in terms of just the approach to the style of music, um, it's really like folky that like they kind of like were one of the leaders of the neo folk genre back in the day, probably is for the most part better than most of the stuff that ended up coming out in that genre. But um, yeah, uh, great band. Uh, they have I, I, my favorite album of theirs is um, all the pretty little horses. I think that album is just about, perfect maybe that would be the best place to start sweet if you didn't like that one then you probably wouldn't like their other stuff either (laughs) all right nice man you had mentioned that you guys are going to be doing a run of shows on the west coast is that like is 
more to come with that and you guys are going to announce it sometime soon um it's not a it's not really a run of west coast dates um i'm not really sure if i'm supposed to talk about it yet because this hasn't been announced obviously but it should be announced pretty soon there will be a local san francisco show in march but that hasn't been announced yet but it's it should happen nice uh then yeah i'm not sure if i'm supposed to talk about the rest of the stuff yet so i mean maybe by the time this comes out it'll uh be announced uh but i'm not i'm just not sure yet so yeah I yeah just probably shouldn't and so like where for when shows get announced or any news with the band gets announced what would be the best place to stay up to date with with what the band is doing uh facebook or instagram um those are the the two things that we we use um generally the flenser will post anything that we do about that kind of stuff as well so if you're already following the flenser or something flenser's on twitter as well um personally not not a huge fan of twitter um so i deleted my account quite some time ago (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm not a big Twitter guy. I don't I'm not a big Facebook guy either, but I still have yeah. both, but Yeah, I I um honestly, I, I I don't mind Instagram, but the rest of it is just it's tough to deal with. I'm not I like I had mentioned at the very beginning of the interview, I'm not super outgoing. I I can be outgoing with friends or you know, when I have to be like when I'm being interviewed or something like that. <laughs> yeah. But uh uh generally I'm not like I don't think my, my, my mode of operating isn't to just like offer information to people. Cause I'm just like, who cares? So I, I, I don't post a huge amount on either of them. I probably would delete Facebook if I didn't feel like I needed it for work and just to run the band's page and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Just kind of necessary at this point. Um, yeah. Uh, Instagram, at least I feel more, it's kind of turning a bit more like Facebook at this point in terms of like the ads and the way the feed is set up, but it's still a little better. At least I feel like you have to make a bit more effort on Instagram to post something. Yeah. So shit, man, Brian, thank you so much for taking your time to do this with me. I really enjoyed our conversation. I'm hoping that at some point in the future, I'll be able to to catch you guys play because I, I would love to see you guys live. Yeah. I mean, I definitely, like I said earlier, I definitely uh, think we'll make it out to the East Coast at some point. I just don't know exactly when. Um, but, and I thank you for interviewing me and for the conversation. It was good. Sweet, man. We'll have a good day, dude. All right. Yeah, you too. And there you have it, folks. That's my conversation with Brian Manning. You know, when Brian and I were talking about Bostonage, and Brian mentioned that people have come up to him and have said that Bostonage sounds like a screamo band. Initially, when he told me that, I was like, no way, I don't hear that at all. But then after he and I spoke, I, I've been listening to their discography a lot lately, and I realized there are some moments in some of their some of their releases where there is some screamo influences that I that I've picked up on. And I don't know if it's because Brian had mentioned that to me, and now I'm I'm trying to see if I could find moments in, in their discography that teeter on Screamo and black metal, but I definitely did notice that after he and I spoke and he had mentioned that to me, so I thought that was kind of interesting. As I mentioned at the the beginning of this episode, I feel super honored that Brian was willing to come on the show. It means a lot to me, so thanks so much, Brian. I'll make sure to add links in the show notes to how you could check out Further Still, how you can listen to Bostonage's other releases, how you could stay up to date with what they've got going on, and also how you can follow Brian on social media as well. Follow the show if you can, rate us, that's always super appreciated. And as always guys, get out there, create something cool. I will see you next time. 